If you've been following my channel for any number of years, you probably realize that for a while there, I stopped talking about AIOs and water coolers and all that sort of stuff, because it seemed like as time went on, energy parts got more efficient and less hot. That's not the case today. So that's why today we're gonna to be talking about the Glacier One 360 mile per hour AIO from Fantex. I honestly don't know what the MPH means. Maybe we'll figure it out in today's review. The new H7 series from NZXT offers tempered glass side panels, toolless panel removal for easy installation, front and top side 360 millimeter radio support, and integrated cable management bar for clean cable installs. To see the complete feature set and variations of the H7 available, including the H7 Flow, follow the link in the description below. Realistically, it's the high core count and density of modern CPUs, both Threadripper, um, well Threadripper specifically, but AMD's mainstream AM4 stuff being up to, you know, 16 cores, 32 threads, or 12 cores, 24 threads. I mean, it's tons of... Realistically, it's Intel's 12th gen now. That's making us really have to revisit this, considering that CPU, without even, like, a major overclock, or any overclock at all, actually, can exceed 200 watts of socket power. So what we got today is the Glacier One 360 uh, MPH AIO. It's going to come in different sizes, 240, 360. Uh, there might even be more than that. I would check the website to see. 360 is like kind of become the more standard because of, the, again, the heat that we're having to deal with in modern CPUs. 240s was like all you ever really needed unless you were going with like an open loop or a custom loop. But now because of the high core counts, 360s are very common. A lot of cases are now making sure that they accommodate a 360 because you do need the extra radiator density uh, or capacity just to be able to keep things cool. Now this is an Asetek design. So what, if you're not aware of what this means, Asetek kind of owns the patent of like, the integrated round pump and like cooling heat plate combo thing. So years ago, there was kind of like a, a battle over who actually owned that patent, but Asetek really kind of won and is out on top on that. So there are brands out there that have their custom one-offs and stuff, but the way this works is Asetek will basically license the technology to brands like this, like Fantex, that want to come up with their own design. Anything that goes on top of that pump whether it be an integrated LCD screen or an LED screen or RGB or the shape, the design, the look, that's all up to the manufacturer that's implementing the Asetek cooler. But the actual Asetek pump design and all that itself is uniform across the board. So it's really gonna perform like an Asetek 360. Well, you know, to be fair, Asetek has improved its designs. It's increased the impeller flow. It's increased the overall size of the cold plate because the cold plate is needs to make sure it's big enough now to touch these CPUs, which are getting larger. Um, and then obviously this one has been upgraded to include LGA 1700, which is Intel 12th gen, which is now a bigger IHS than it used to be. So the cold plate and stuff itself has had to expand. What you don't want are the small holes on the bottom, the little screws that hold the cold plate on. You don't want that to be touching anywhere in the IHS because that's gonna be areas where it's not actually touching the IHS because the screws are recessed, which means less efficient cooling. This is an Intel 10th gen, a 10900K, 10 core, 20 thread CPU. And um, theoretically, I, I should be doing this on 12th gen because that realist, that's the trouble child. That's the one that's kind of causing problems these days but I actually don't have a 12th gen test rig. That's something we're gonna have to be building here in the near future. I didn't, 12th gen to me is kind of a one-off in that if we are, and this is a little side ramp, if we're doing testing and stuff, what we would then really be testing in terms of gaming performance and cooling and all that is very specific to the 12th gen. Like how does the E core and P core operate in that particular workflow? Like is, how's it handing off? Um, how's the task scheduler working? The heat, in 12th gen is like the highest amongst all the desktop CPUs right now. And that's gonna be very specific to that CPU. So I still feel like in terms of trying to hit the broad spectrum of people and how they would be affected by certain things, I still found 10th gen or AM4, like our 5900 or 5950X and 5900X builds to be more like indicative of what people are experiencing. But as time goes on, we're gonna obviously have to update our testing methodology on that. So one of the ways you end up taking an Asetek cooler and making it hundreds of dollars as you add things like LCD screens and fan controllers and control boxes and all that stuff. Fantex, on the other hand, has kind of just gone the more simple route where they basically just have, well, not the most expensive packaging, but this is perfectly fine, just an RGB top on there. It's nothing crazy. Um, okay, and in terms of sizes, we do have a 240 MP, a 240 MPH, Oh, the difference is the halo fan. 
So that's where the, the H is. H is a Halo fan. Um, so we have 240, 280, and 360. Those are the three sizes available. And of course, we have the bracketry and such to support uh, any of the different types of builds that we have. So this is the Halo right here. So these mount to the fan. So the RGB is actually not part of the fan. It's part of this thing that you put on the fan, and it's just an RGB ring in there. And it is a JST connector with a piggyback. So you can piggyback them, uh, so you only have to worry about one JST input. One thing I want you to notice too is how short the cables are. With a built-in splitter, this is gonna keep things nice and tidy on your AIO. So you're not having to like zigzag the wires and zip tie them all tight and have a big bulge of wires back here. You can actually plug these in. These are very stormtrooper-y. I love white and black builds. I know white builds today are almost like, how solid white can we get it? But I've always liked the Stormtrooper look and the black rubber standoff is nice. And you know why I'm happy about black rubber standoffs here? White rubber turns yellow over time. So even if it's just sitting in your system, not doing anything other than just cooling and not moving, it will turn yellow over time. So the, the black on there, um, it's kind of nice to see black cables too. So you could really tie in a Stormtrooper theme on that if you wanted. Whoa, that's like a speckle. So the paint on this radiator is unlike anything I've seen yet on a white build. It's actually got like a flake in there. It's almost like a metallic or a pearl. It's also very polished and very smooth. That's actually really cool. Um, and then this is, this is the Asetek part. It says Fantex, but it's Asetek. So if you were to take this pump and compare it to an older Asetek, you would notice it's bigger. The cold plate itself is also a little bit larger, but see the screw holes? That's what I was talking about. Like those screw holes are what you technically don't want touching the IHS because those screws are not gonna be touching the IHS or there's an extra transfer that has to take place between IHS through screw through cold plate and it's not very efficient. But we've got white braided uh, cables here and then we've got a nice short, just standard PWM CPU header. The Asetek pump does not take a lot of heat or a lot of energy to run. So you can run it off an AIO header or a CPU uh, header on your motherboard if you don't want to deal with the whole like no CPU found and then having to turn it off in the BIOS. And then this part right here, this is the, this is the Fantex part of it. So this is where Fantex kind of got involved and said, here's what we're going to do. It's exactly the same as the one that we did in the little um, SS, SFF build with the 120. It's just this one is white. When it lights up, this is an infinity mirror inside here. And then you can see right here, this is also a JST plug uh, with a splitter on it. So anyway, these are magnets to hold it onto the top right there. But it's also got this felt kind of a liner, which is nice because then it's, I think that's just gonna help with any sort of vibration or rattle sound. If you by chance did not want to run RGB, which you don't have to, this plug is removable. So that's something nice to see. If, if you just like, I want the white, but I don't care about the RGB, you can absolutely unplug that cable and then you don't have the cable sticking out that you have to deal with and route anywhere. So nice to see a detachable RGB cable. All of the bracketry and stuff that comes with it. I'm most concerned about what sort of RGB cables they give us because that will tell us how we can integrate it with our system, especially if your motherboard doesn't include any sort of JST RGB. So this, is gonna be a splitter for your pump, not your fans, your pump. Because if you're gonna be plugging this into the CPU header and you still have something else that you wanna have running off of that header or a high amp header or whatever, these pumps do not use a lot of power so you should be able to run multiple, like a fan if you want and the pump off of it. That way you can have, let's say the fans and the pump running off of the same um, PWM circuit so that way they can speed up and slow down together. You just run the splitter. There we go. We do have a JST2 standard three pin ARGB plus splitter available to us. That's what I was most concerned about because JSTs on motherboards are rare. You do, you can't find them, but they're rare. Then we get a fan extension cable. So this is gonna be perfect for our radiator fans because we need to extend off of those short ones. And then in terms of thermal paste, they give you plenty. Although this is probably only filled to like right there. I wish these were white, honestly, because they're white tubes. These are just like combs for the tubes. So you can keep the tubes together so they're not like, blah, you know, in your system like crazy like that. Uh, Intel retention plates, AMD retention screws, Intel retention screws, radiator uh, screws, and then standoffs for Intel. So let's do this. Let's go ahead and uh, assemble it. Let's get it in our test rig and let's throw some 
Cinebench at it. This is an overclocked rig. It'll be a pretty good indicator of what kind of normal temps to expect on a system that does not require the power of a supernova to run. So, I mean, the daisy chaining and stuff's a nice idea, but it's still kind of a jumbled mess. And I have a lot of zip ties on here because these fan cables are a little too long. Like, I know what they were doing, but it's almost like they're one connector too long on each one. So by the time you get to the end down here, you got this piece you've got to fold over. And then with them all being black, if any of it's hanging down or looks like crap in your case, it's gonna be very noticeable if it's in a white case. When you look at it from this perspective though, it really isn't bad. It looks pretty good. Um, these are set to pull because of the way that this particular test bench is. It's at this weird angle. So heat wants to rise naturally. So I'm having a pull cooled air from here and then rise it out. So we're using a little convection uh, to assist with it. The halo ring on there adds a bit of clutter, as you can imagine. It's, I mean, I know Fantex makes RGB fans, so that's why I'm just kind of confused as to why they would do the halo route. So coming down this harness that I had to make, it's also all these JST plugs and splitters. So anyway, fortunately that'll be hidden down in here. I mean, not like we can hide anything in this case anyway. I'm not gonna be, continue to use this as a test bench anymore. We'll finally move back to a real case, but um, you could hide all that in the backside of your motherboard. But this, this is just still a lot to deal with for a system that doesn't have a controller. So it's kind of a catch-22, right? Use a controller, up the cost. Let your motherboard do it, have more wires. So you kind of have to make that decision on how you want to do it. So the AIO is installed. We've got the halo rings on here. One thing Phil pointed out that we kind of wish was the case is like on the, this is a 3D rendering. This is not really a photo here. If it is a photo, then we think what they did to make these nice and flush mounted is they uh, removed the rubber, remember I showed you this rubber isolator. So they create a gap between the fan right there. So if I were going to be using this permanently, and I don't know how long it's gonna stay on here, but I would remove those rubber pieces so that the halo can sit down flush. So right now they're just set to red. It's gonna do whatever Aura does. So I've got Aura Sync up right now, and it's just gonna do whatever Aura is set to. But you know what, it's funny. I initially didn't think I would like the halo, but they really add depth to the fan because they shine, they shine down through the fan. Where instead of having a ring inside the fan and then the blades illuminating, the blades turning, the light hits differently. So it actually looks really cool. I actually like this more than I thought it would. So in terms of the lighting effects and stuff, you know, you've got the preloaded basic effects from Aura or whatever you decide to set up inside of the Aura creator. Um, I'll just leave them on the RGB right now. <laughs> it's such a different kind of light, honestly, because it's bouncing around so much. But that's secondary. We need to see how it's gonna perform in something like Cinebench. Now, I'll be honest, it's gonna perform like any other Asetek 360, because it is. So all the cores are sitting in the 20s and they're bouncing around a little bit because we got a, this is a test bench. It's got a bunch of stuff that will run, you know. But anyway, let's see what we immediately spike up to here. 62, 64, 65, 66. Look at the cores in the 60s. The voltage is at uh, 1.32. Frequency is currently at five gigahertz. I missed this. 12th gen really uh, groomed us to just accept high temps, didn't it? <laughs> it's also why I was never in such a hurry to make 12th gen my personal rig at home. When it's all said and done and normalizes, it'll probably end up being somewhere in the, the low to mid 70s, which again, with a five gigahertz all core overclock on 10th gen is perfectly fine. I could get a 5.2, all core if I wanted out of this, but it, it's totally unnecessary for this particular build. Only one core hit 70C so far, that was core five. This is also the pre-applied thermal paste that comes from Asetek. And you may have noticed that tube we talked about is perfect because I, I, so many people have gone to install their, their AIOs and then they have to take it off for some reason because maybe they routed something wrong or they have to redo it for some reason. And then they're like, crap, I have no thermal paste. So it's nice to have some extra thermal paste in case you have to take it off. I don't really like to run the basic thermal paste that comes with any coolers. I tend to run the Kingpin KPX Extreme with all of my, or Kingpin Extreme cooling uh, thermal paste on all my builds. And then I pre-apply it to the, th to the heat spreader and I spread it with the spatula and, uh, or the little thermal paste spreader. And I find that I get better temps with that with doing that. So there's a lot of other extreme paste out there, which will drop it a couple of C, um, which I think will give you better spread also than the Asetek. Like I feel like if I took this cooler off right now, you'd see that the spread of that circle doesn't make it all the way to the edge of the IHS. And fully covering it, getting full coverage, will give you slightly better temps. But as it is right now, we're still sitting here in the 60s. Our hottest core hits 71. 
Over the course of maybe a half hour or so, we would end up getting uh, a couple degrees higher than that. Like I said, probably low 70s. And this is also the best case scenario where it is open air. So what we're testing when we do this, and by not putting it in a case, is we're not testing how much does the case affect the cooling of the cooler. We're affecting how much does, or testing how much does the cooler affect the temps of the CPU with nothing else affecting the cooler itself. So like the fans right now are also running at 100%. Not hearing any crazy motor whine or buzzing. They're also nearly perfectly horizontal, which is the you know best case scenario. We're at a little bit of an angle. Um, this is also with the tubing the way it is, not exactly the most ideal setup because of the fact that you know air can gather in the tubing here. But we've been running AIOs on this test bench now for almost two years, and we've never had any sort of issues with sublamination or air getting its way into the pump and then causing us any sort of um, cavitation or issues with the cooling because it would just sort of settle up here anyway. But what you don't want is the pump to be at the highest point. As long as the pump is at the highest point, it will all work fine. Not to mention this loop didn't really have much sloshing when I shook it around, so that means it is filled pretty high. There's gonna be a slight amount of air in there. You can't get all the air out ever, but it's not gonna be causing a problem for us. If it started making sloshing or swirling noises, then that would mean that we could potentially have an air problem. These are sealed systems. There's no way to refill them. There's no way to like top them off. Once they start doing that, if any evaporation does take place through the loop, then it's time to replace the unit. Anyway, through all that talking, our package maxed out at 71. It's currently at 69. Clearly, I would have no issues whatever, whatsoever running this on a 10900K or any sort of Ryzen system or even a 12th gen and feel like I'm gonna have any sort of cooling issues. So there you go, guys. That has been the Glacier One 360 MPH or 360 miles per hour. Comes in black and white, 240, 280, and 360 variants, both with and without the halo. If it has the H, it has the halo. If it doesn't, it doesn't have it, which will also bring the cost down. And uh, the 360 clearly would be able to cool your, your CPUs without any problem. Can't speak for the 240s and 280s because I haven't used them, but I can tell you based on thermal capacity of these loops and the thermal needs of anything under 12th gen, you'd be just fine. 12th gen, you'd probably not be able to do any sort of overclocking. In fact, you'd probably have to go in and start doing some undervolting even with the 360. But that's just the way 12th gen is. All right, guys, thanks for watching. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.